Good evening. I'm Marvin Pinkert, Executive Director of the Jewish Museum of Maryland. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to another in our series of presentations related to the current special exhibit, Jews in Space, Members of the Tribe in Orbit. If you missed prior programs, including our very special evening with Mark Okran, the who developed the Klingon and Vulcan languages for Star Trek, you will find recordings on our website. I'm asking Trillian to put it, the link in the chat. This is also where you can get tickets to see the exhibit, open by reservations on Sundays, Tuesdays, and Thursdays, except Thanksgiving, of course. Tonight's program, The Schwartz is with us, Mel Brooks and the Power of Parody, pays tribute to the man who inspired the title of this exhibit. And as a special treat to guide us through this tribute, we have Maryland's own Yoda of pop culture, Dr. Arnold Bloomberg. And now it's my delight to introduce Dr. Arnold Bloomberg. Dr. Bloomberg is an author, editor, book designer, educator, and pop culture historian. He has taught writing, literature, and media literacy courses with special focus on topics such as zombies, superheroes, and comic book history. He recently authored Journey of the Living Dead, a look at 100 years of zombie cinema, and is currently working on a three-volume series examining the first 10 years of the Marvel Cinematic Universe. His small press publishing company can be found online at www.atbpublishing.com. This is by no, means doc, by no means Dr. Bloomberg's first rodeo at the JMM. We have ple previously enjoyed his hot insights into the story of the Gollum and the hijinks of the Marx Brothers. Now I, I get to sit back and enjoy with you the humor of Mel Brooks, yogurt optional. Welcome, Dr. Bloomberg. Well, thank you very much, Marvin. It's a pleasure as always. I think it's my favorite intro I've ever gotten out to. That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, and hi everybody um i wish it could be in a room with all of you for real this is the way it is right now and it's a pleasure to be able to do something like this at least and connect with a bunch of people and to give me an excuse to talk about one of my favorite people in the entire world mel brooks how could i not want to do that i grew up with this man and i think when you grow up jewish in a certain time and place certain things happen to you culturally. And this all feels very personal to me in a way that maybe a lot of other things I talk about, I enjoy talking about, I enjoy sharing, but uh, this feels very intimate. Mel Brooks is one of those figures, to me, feels like another grandfather. It's difficult to separate this incredible uh, icon that he became in pop culture from the experience of being Jewish in America in the 20th century and early 21st century. And the fact that he brought so much humor that is unique to us and that feels like the sort of thing you'd expect to find in your own family and brought it into the mainstream and made it something that moviegoers around the world enjoyed in a way that very few people have done so successfully. So what we're going to do tonight is just take a little look back at his entire career, how he got to the, the point of being such a figure and also what those connections are to the Jews in Space exhibit and a few other tidbits along the way. And to do that, I'll probably be hiding behind some slides as I do this, I'm gonna share this with all of you, but uh, I think you'll like seeing some of the pictures as well. So it won't be a loss. You won't see my face all the time, but that's okay. But um, to go to this in particular here, I'm gonna switch this back. Hopefully you're seeing this now. Um, the Schwartz is with us, but Anyway, as I said, Mel Brooks, towering icon in pop culture. I did get to meet him once and only once, uh, and the man is in his 90s now, and hopefully it won't be the last opportunity I have, but I did meet him years ago when he was doing a book tour, and there is something inexplicably familiar and intimate about the way he behaves and his persona, and that's why, that's the thing that sticks the most with me, but let's take a look back at where he began and how he became Mel Brooks, because he wasn't Mel Brooks when he first started. He was Melvin Kaminsky, and he was born in Brooklyn, grew up in Williamsburg in Brooklyn, and he was born in 1926. And that's him in the center there in that picture. Not everybody else in that picture is identified, but uh, we do know that this picture was taken outside of his grandparents' house in Bensonhurst. So 
Uh, I'm not sure if those are cousins or what, but it's one of the rare things where we don't really have a lot of information, but we know that's Mel Brooks sitting, standing right there in the middle. And it's kind of hard to mistake. Uh, in fact, it looks like he's already kind of learning how to be a showman right from the very beginning. They start as Melvin Kaminsky. According to him, and of course, this is the other thing, with a man like Mel Brooks, you have to take everything he ever says about himself with a grain of salt, because the man's an entertainer, he's, uh, he's quite a raconteur, and it's not entirely certain that everything he'll tell you is 100% the truth, but it is certain that everything he tells you will be 100% designed to make you feel good and entertain you. So according to him, he was a sickly child, um, really loved movies, and one of his favorite stories that he used to tell was that when he went to see Frankenstein in the theaters in 1931, he was terrified of the Frankenstein monster. And in fact, was telling his mother, you know, I don't know what's going to happen. The Frankenstein monster is going to come to get me. His bedroom actually connected to a fire escape outside their building. So he wanted to close the window, but it was hot in Brooklyn and they wanted to keep the windows open. So his mother had to spend time explaining to him that if the Frankenstein monster really wanted to kill him, it would have to catch a ship from Eastern Europe over the United States, find a way to take a train, get all the way to Brooklyn and know where his address was and that it was very unlikely. And so that apparently calmed him down quite a bit. Frankenstein monster, not good at travel. So this is how Melvin Kaminsky began. But as someone who was basically predisposed to be an entertainer. One of the earliest things that he did starting around the age of 14 was to be a tumbler. And as I'm sure many of you are already familiar with, a tumbler would be sort of an all purpose entertainer who would often be sent out in all sorts of occasions, particularly around the Catskills. Grossinger has wound up being his headlining act for most of his career. He worked at Grossinger's for quite a while. And the idea was you're the MC, you're the comedian, you're the entertainer between other entertainers. This was a guy who was all about being extremely extroverted and extremely energetic in everything he did. Apparently one of his signature bits was he would put on a huge alpaca coat and a hat and grab a bunch of suitcases and fill them with rocks and say, I can't take it anymore. My business failed and jump into the nearest pool. And that would get people going. So this was how Mel Brooks began. At some point in his teens, he changed his name officially to Mel Brooks from Melvin Kaminsky. Um, and that name became part of the legend and the icon that he is and made him particularly marketable as an entertainer. He did, however, have a break from entertaining and tumbling when he went into the war. And he was actually over in Europe. And this always gets me, is that he was actually in a unit apparently that would go and defuse landmines and try to make areas safe for other units to go through. That just sounds to me like such a harrowing experience. Of course, all of it is harrowing, but particularly that's what he was assigned to do for most of his time in the war. And even his war experience, he would always tilt into something comedic. He was apparently still very focused on making sure that everybody else he served with felt good, uh, felt entertained, would be the comedian of the group uh, and many years afterward would still make jokes about it. Like one of his routines where he would talk about Churchill would often uh, say the word Nazi, but he'd say it like sounding like Narzi. So his joke was always, we're all out there looking for Narzis. We didn't know what we were doing. So he was in World War II for two years, came back home and immediately went back into being a tumbler at Grossinger's. And he was extremely popular. During that time, he met a young man by the name of Sid Caesar, who was currently getting a lot of acting gigs, writing gigs, and was looking to develop a television show at the birth of what would become known as the golden age of television. The result was that Mel Brooks joined the writing team of what became one of the most influential shows, certainly in comedy, possibly just in television in general, that ever happened at that point in time, your show of shows. And he was on there 1950 to 1954. This picture is kind of interesting that you're looking at too. When I was putting this together, I was actually surprised at just how many uh, Getty images, official images from the Getty archives and uh, professional photography was done on the set. Because one of the things about a lot of the old 50s shows is we don't have everything. Sometimes things don't look as good as they could. 
And I was actually surprised how much documentation there is of the behind the scenes activity that went into making your show of shows, which is this incredible, iconic, towering achievement in television, particularly in variety television. And this particular picture, there's several versions of it, but there's Brooks on the left there. He's joined by Mel Tolkien right next to him, who was another one of the regular writers. Other writers who worked on your show of shows at the time, besides Caesar himself and Imogene Coca and Howie Morris and a few other people, also include Woody Allen in one of the earliest uh, parts of his career. Uh, and another man that we'll be talking about soon, Carl Reiner. But the guy on the right is Pat Weaver. And Pat Weaver was the creator of your show of shows, uh, The Tonight Show, the first version of Tonight with Steve Allen, uh, The Today Show. And he's Sigourney Weaver's father, the actor Sigourney Weaver. He's quite an icon himself and one of the architects of that particular age of television and so much of our entertainment even today. Your show of shows was a massive hit. It helped to hone Brooks's comedic uh, uh, design, the way he would come up with a joke, the way he would shape something. He was a writer there, le less a performer than a writer at that point. But what was very clear was that he was someone who could uh, turn something into solid gold comedy wise. There are other pictures of him literally dancing on top of desks in order to convey a particular idea to Caesar. And his energy was just boundless. And it was very clear that soon enough, this was the kind of man who was going to go off into something on his own. And part of that came about with one of the most enduring friendships in pop culture history. I think the picture on the right is one of my favorite pictures of two people that I love in entertainment that I've ever seen. It's just a picture of pure love and joy. I love that. Sadly, of course, Carl Reiner died recently. Um, and it was the kind of loss that you feel when someone famous dies that feels like family. And it's hard to separate the two because we're so emotionally connected to so many of the things we love in entertainment when you grow up with these things. And Carl Reiner himself is someone we can do an entire presentation on. Creator of the Dick Van Dyke Show, someone who went on to be a director and a writer. Uh, his son, Rob Reiner, is also a hugely successful director and creator. And the friendship that he and Mel Brooks forged while working on your show of shows was an enduring one that lasted into mutually into their 90s. In fact, one of the things that came up even a few years ago uh, was the fact that they had, were so intimately connected with one another. They lived right next to each other. And for years and years and years, right up until Carl Reiner's death, they would spend every night together eating dinner together and watching Jeopardy. This was their lives together. Uh, they were more connected to each other than, than almost anybody you could think of. And the 2,000-year-old man was a routine that helped to cement both of them in the pop culture consciousness and bring some of what I was saying, some of this uniquely Jewish tone and approach to comedy in the world that only someone like Mel Brooks could do. And the whole basic gimmick of the 2,000-year-old man was Carl Reiner is your basic... Um, He's your basic straight man. He's the interviewer. And he just turned one day while they were trying to entertain friends to Mel Brooks and said, is it true that you're 2000 years old? And Brooks just started improv and before long they had material. This led to decades and decades of albums, live performances, books, everything you can think of, all built around the initial idea that Brooks is a 2000 year old man who's seen everything and done everything and has a uniquely Jewish way of looking at it. And this was something that not only got them in front of a lot of other people in terms of television, in terms of entertainment, but also demonstrated the fact that Mel Brooks himself, besides just being a great comedic mind, was also a great performer. And this is something that would hold him in good stead for everything else that he went on to do. One of the things that my presentation is about, and that the Schwartz is with us uh, right up was, was trying to convey, was the idea that Brooks devoted himself through a lot of his career to parody, to looking at things in the world and poking fun at them, skewering them, skewing them comedically, and basically showing us how silly the world is by putting all these things through his particular lens. It's something that would coalesce through many of the most popular films he ever made later. But here with the 2000 year old man, is where a lot of that sensibility, you can really hear that in a lot of the things that they did. 
Um, and of course, there are also things that he was a part of that some people don't tend to remember. I don't know how many of you remember Get Smart from, well, it says right there in front of you, from 1965 to 1970. It ran for five years. It was during the time when Bond and everything James Bond related was some of the most popular stuff in entertainment. And there were countless copycat films and series and on television, particularly just on television alone, you had things like from Mission Impossible to Man from Uncle, all kinds of things. And Brooks's idea was to partner with another comedy writer, Buck Henry, and create a parody of that. Through Get Smart, Brooks and Henry took a look at the whole conception of the secret agent and the way that it had been so embraced, not just in America, but globally in pop culture, and took a look at how silly all of that is. Everything from the ridiculous kind of uh, technical gadgets they'd have, whether it was the shoe phone, which you can see right there, or the cone of silence, which would come down from the ceiling to cover people so they could cover up whatever they're saying, only it never worked right, to the bigger issues, like just the absolute stupidity of people fighting with one another when everybody is all the same. From little issues to big, Mel Brooks's comedy was about taking the world and looking at it from a Jewish perspective, from a wry perspective, and giving it that little twist. Get Smart was a huge success for many years. And to this day, there are people who don't necessarily think of it in terms of being one of Brooks's creations. And it's a co-creation. But it's certainly one of the things early on that demonstrated the kind of work he could do and that particular sensibility that would carry through everything. Now, of course, in some respects, you could argue that the Mel Brooks we know most, the man and the work that we're most familiar with, kind of launches officially here in 1968 with a movie called The Producers. Now, one of the elements that makes Brooks so unique and so memorable is also one of the things that is also often given him the most trouble and certainly generated the most controversy. And that's that Brooks has a very particular perspective on how comedy functions in culture. One of those bits comes from his experience in World War II we were talking about earlier. I guess when you're in the situation where you're diffusing landmines and you don't know whether you're going to live from one minute to the next, and you know that all this is the result of some insane sociopath somewhere, you develop a particular worldview. And in Mel Brooks's case, one of the things he often felt was you could take away the power of things that had the ability to hurt you or to dominate you by turning them into a joke. And this is not something that everybody agrees with. And to be perfectly honest, I myself often feel there's a line where there are things that are just not funny anymore. But Mel Brooks thought Hitler was very funny. And if you did it just the right way, you could take away the power that someone like that had over people, over the world, over history, and turn them into a laughing stock. And the producers, as I'm sure many of you already know, is based on the idea of two down and out guys who come up with this incredible idea that they can make more money with a play that fails than a play that's a hit. And all they need to do is put on the worst play possible. It will fail that night. They'll be able to take all the money with them and it'll all work out. And the play, of course, they settle on is one called Springtime for Hitler. And one of the showpieces of this entire movie is a huge production number in which everybody in the movie is singing gloriously about springtime for Hitler. The entire thing is obviously meant not just as a joke about the people making the play or the silliness of doing something that obscene or that offensive, but also the notion from outside the film itself of how ridiculous all of that is. And that's how Mel Brooks approached all of that material. The idea that this is how you regain control. You turn these things into comedy and into a joke. And the producers featured Zero Mostel, he's there on the left, and Gene Wilder in the first instance of him and Mel Brooks working together, which they would continue to do, as we'll see. In the middle there is Kenneth Mars, an amazing character actor who plays the German playwright who wrote Springtime for Hitler. He thinks it's a serious play. We all know different. And The Producers has become a massive classic. Uh, and of course, as many of you also probably already know, and we'll get to a little later on, it has also shown an incredible ability to live beyond its years and transform into yet another stunning achievement when he actually took it onto Broadway. But this was the start of his career making films. 
And although the producers was not a parody per se, it has a lot of that same kind of idea. Take sensible things, weird things, strange things that in the regular world might be things you would never even want to look at, twist them, turn them, skewer them, and the result is Mel Brooks comedy. Now, I also want to mention, I'm going to skip a couple things that uh, when I was a kid and I used to write down lists of all the movies I wanted to see, I'd make a list of all the Mel Brooks movies I wanted to see. There were two that always seemed to disappear off many lists. I don't know why, but for some reason, a lot of people never gave them the same regard as other films. One of them was a movie he did two years after this called The Twelve Chairs that was an adaptation of a Russian novel. It was a big failure at the time. But now people that are Mel Brooks fans look back on it and say, well, it was one of his early attempts to try to create something different in film. It doesn't quite fit with a lot of the other things he did. Uh, it doesn't quite have the same tone. And I didn't make a slide for it. I'm sorry, 12 chairs, but that's the way it is. But I did mention you, so there's that. Next, however, the most important thing is to move on to Blazing Saddles. So in 1974, Mel Brooks is brought in to fix a script that no one wanted to produce that was sitting around for quite a while at the studio. It had been designed as a film about a black sheriff coming into a white town and nobody could figure out how to make it work. What Mel Brooks wound up doing was bringing in people like Richard Pryor, who was initially going to play the sheriff and then wound up stepping away from that. Long story about that one. If we had a whole night to talk about Blazing Saddles, I would tell you all of that. Um, and a number of other people, including, as you can see here in this picture, Gene Wilder again, and shape it into something that would be not only entertaining, but marketable. And the result is Blazing Saddles. Cleavon Little is the man that wound up playing Bart, uh, the black sheriff who comes into the town and winds up winning over a group of racists who are also fighting yet another group of racists. And Blazing Saddles is one of those movies you grew up with that has some of the most incredibly sharp dialogue, brilliantly funny comedy, and yet also some of the most juvenile jokes you can possibly imagine, uh, including a sequence I'm sure a lot of people know very well involving a group of cowboys sitting around a fire and having eaten maybe a few too many beans. Now, there's one thing that Mel Brooks is also known for. It's being a child at heart. And a lot of his humor winds up, winds up coming across that way too. Very childlike. The thing about Blazing Saddles is it's an extraordinary commentary on racism in the United States. It's very potent. It's also extremely uncomfortable today. In 2020, I guarantee you, I don't think they even would release this movie. There's stuff in it, including the use of particular language that we're much more sensitive to now in a way that actually would curtail the ability of Brooks and everybody involved to tell the story in the way they told it in this particular film. But it does stand the test of time, even with those things that are different now and our level of sensitivity is different because its heart is definitely in the right place. It's an extraordinary commentary through parodying Westerns and taking all of these tropes that American entertainment had used for decades and putting these cowboy characters and those settings in a world in which a black man is confronted with all of these things and fights back and demonstrates not only his worth, but the incredible stupidity of seeing just the color of someone's skin. It's an extraordinary achievement. But it's also a movie that's very specific to the 1970s in a way that's almost hard to explain. But it's certainly a movie that helped put Mel Brooks on the map and demonstrated that one of his greatest strengths was taking things we're familiar with, in this case, the American Western, and making a parody that shows where all the craziness is in that kind of a setting and doing something that actually comments on the present day. In fact, Blazing Saddles is way ahead of its time. It has a whole sort of meta ending where the characters actually cross over into the present day, come out of the film onto the studio sets, and it just breaks all sorts of barriers in ways that are incredibly inventive and very few people would even think to do in a movie. What's amazing also is that after having created something like that, he could go ahead and create something else the very same year. And in 1974, he also did Young Frankenstein. Gene Wilder had pitched him on the idea while they were making Blazing Saddles. 
And as I mentioned, Mel Brooks as a little kid, little Melvin Kaminsky, the scared of the Frankenstein monster. Well, this was his ode to all the universal horror movies of the 30s and 40s. And in fact, most of the set pieces you see in the movie, including all of the laboratory equipment in Frankenstein's lab, are all the original pieces that were originally built and used in the Frankenstein films in the 30s. Many of them had been in storage and rusted, and he used a lot of them in 1974 for young Frankenstein. And you can see the sort of eclectic cast there, Wilder in the lead, as Frankenstein, Peter Boyle as the monster, and British comedian Marty Feldman joined Terry Garr and the whole team. A lot of the people that wound up working with Brooks for years to come were sort of coalescing around him. Another person not pictured here is Madeline Kahn, who would also wind up working with him in a number of films. Young Frankenstein attacks the horror genre in the same way Blazing Saddles completely goes crazy with the idea of the American Western. And with another parody, takes a look at the silliness of that and also basic ideas of human nature. There's a scene at the end of Young Frankenstein where the creature gets to make a speech about how he's been misunderstood his entire life. And in the midst of the most insane, ridiculous comedy, you have a moment that feels truer and more human than you'd often get in a lot of dramas. And that's something that's part of the power, I think, of what Mel Brooks does. We're skipping one again, by the way. I told you I, I was being incredibly unfair to the 12 chairs. I'm also gonna be unfair to one called Silent Movie. He did one as, as an ode to all the silent films. Marty Feldman joined him again, uh, Dom DeLuise, and they did sort of an ode to old Hollywood. It doesn't quite fit in with some of the things I'm talking about, so I'm skipping it. Don't tell anybody. Anyway, moving on to High Anxiety in 1977. We've covered Westerns, we've covered horror movies. With High Anxiety, Mel Brooks turns to another favorite group of films, the work of Alfred Hitchcock. I actually think sometimes High Anxiety is my favorite Mel Brooks movie ever. Although I say that and right now I change my mind and sometimes it's Young Frankenstein's, whatever one I might be watching that minute actually. But High Anxiety is an extraordinary piece of work, particularly if you're a Hitchcock fan that has a sense of humor and is willing to see the work of that legend um, lovingly poked fun at. You can see it happen in high anxiety with elements of vertigo and uh, of well, everything. And I've actually done a number of film series with some other groups, including um, the Osher Institute, where we take a look at the works of various filmmakers. I've done runs of Hitchcock films. And what I've found interesting is when you revisit Hitchcock, I find you even get a new appreciation for what he did when you see the way Mel Brooks took all of that and turned it into something incredibly funny and uh, takes us all in high anxiety to the Institute for the very, very nervous uh, psychiatric Institute where horrible things are happening. Many of them being perpetrated by Cloris Leachman and Harvey Korman, uh, but Madeline Kahn is there too. And this is also a case where Mel Brooks decided to step in front of the camera as well as behind. He had actually already taken the lead role in silent movie and in high anxiety, he's Dr. Thorndike, the actual protagonist in this. He also gets an incredible dance and singing routine where he sings the title theme of High Anxiety and gets to live out all of his crooner dreams. But as many of us already know, he has a long history as a tumbler, so he knows how to be on stage and do all kinds of things and be a jack of all trades. High Anxiety is an incredible piece of work. One of the things that comes up in a parody that's done well is that it demonstrates not only an awareness of the genre that the comedian's working in, but demonstrates their love for it. That's one of the things I think is particularly key for Mel Brooks. He never seems like he's uh, mad at the things he's poking fun at. There's a kind of comedy that comes from ridiculing something. He doesn't ridicule. He parodies, he does satire, but it comes from a place of love where he respects and loves the things he's using. But then he says, let's take a look at how funny it can be. And I feel that ultimately that again, is something that's distinctly Jewish, distinctly uh, useful culturally, and ultimately, I just think, more, uh, more successful. Another of them, uh, the films that he did at this point, sort of coming to the end of what many people regard as his incredible classic run of parody films, is History of the World Part One. Spoiler alert, there was never a part two, but that was part of the joke. And through History of the World, 
He took a look at a number of different eras of human history and in essence really parodied the films that often depicted those eras. So in other words, we get uh, Mel Brooks right there being the waiter at the last, uh, the last Supper there. And it's John Hurt, British character actor John Hurt as Jesus. And actually it's a parody of Bible epics. And then there's also a parody of Roman, all sorts of eras. But key to what we're all here to talk about is the fact that at the very end of the film, as a little preview of what was to come in future installments of History of the World, and again, spoiler alert, that was never going to happen. It wasn't the plan, it was just a joke, was that History of the World ends with a short film called Jews in Space, in which we see a group of very Star Wars-like Mug and Dovid ships flying through space, flown by Hasidic rabbis, and fighting Gentile ships. And as the theme music plays and we hear the song singing about how the Jews are fighting Goyim in space, we see the, the incredible success of the Star David ships. They're incredibly designed models, by the way. Not done by the people that did Star Wars or any of those. It was a totally independent group that did all the special effects for the short but incredibly effective sequence. And one of the things that's really cool about this that's another aspect of why parody works when it works well, is that although it's silly and you know that it's not something from say Star Wars or Star Trek or anything like that, Jews in Space looks as real, as convincing, as polished as any space epic that was being done at that time. It just happens to look like Jewish ships, little stars of David, but the effects are exactly the same caliber. And that's part of the key. If you're going to parody something, you got to make sure that your stuff looks as authentic as the real McCoy. Otherwise, it's not going to work the same way. It's going to seem like you failed. Mel Brooks always succeeds when he goes into things like this. Jews in Space was the inspiration for the title of this, but it also demonstrates his willingness to poke fun at himself. And I will also note that one of the other previews uh, happens right before Jews in Space is a moment where you see uh, Hitler on ice. And it sounds it's exactly what it sounds like, Hitler on ice. One of the films he did that some people forget is he did a remake of an Ernst Lubitsch film that originally starred Jack Benny in the original version, To Be or Not To Be, which is, I think, a wonderful movie. Um, like I said, often overlooked because it's not one that he actually directed or wrote. He just starred in it. But uh, it's an incredible piece of work about uh, Polish uh, uh, actor and his theater troupe, many of whom are Jewish, who are suddenly caught in the midst of the Nazis and finding a way somehow to escape that also involves disguise, a uh, bit of double identity, uh, a bit where Brooks's character has to actually masquerade as Hitler. Mel Brooks isn't happy unless Hitler shows up at some point in some of his stuff and it happens a lot. Key element though for To Be or Not To Be is it also features his wife, Anne Bancroft, who is basically the love of his life. And if there was one other relationship besides his friendship with Carl Reiner that was important to his entire life and career, it was the bond that he shared with Anne Bancroft, who he met in the 60s while rehearsing for the Perry Como show. And apparently as the story goes, he saw her across the stage preparing for a number and just yelled across the stage at her, hey, Anne Bancroft, I'm Mel Brooks. And she said, that was it, love at first sight. So that's how to do it apparently sometimes. Uh, they, and uh, she died several years back, um, but they were together for decades and decades. Their son, Max Brooks, I also know pretty well. You heard from the intro that I tend to do a lot of things associated with zombies. He wrote a book called World War Z that was turned into a big epic zombie film. So oddly enough, Mel Brooks' son is a zombie expert. We're everywhere. Then we get to Spaceballs, the movie that I should have been spending more time on, but that's the way timing works out. It took him a while, 10 years since the creation of the original Star Wars in 1977, but he finally got around to parodying Star Wars and space movies a little more than he did with the Jews in Space short in Spaceballs. And that's him playing Yogurt, his version of Yoda. Um, and not only does it parody all the tropes of space films and those kind of adventure epics, but it also parodies so much about our experience of those films, in particular merchandising. There's an entire sequence with the yogurt character where we find out he's already ready for the success of Spaceballs and has put together a lot of merchandise to sell related to it. 
Truth is, Spaceballs didn't do nearly as well as a lot of Mel Brooks's earlier films, but it's still an example of the kind of work that he could do when he took a genre or something popular and threw it through his particular perspective. And Spaceballs, I think, stands the test of time more so than a lot of his later work, unfortunately, has in the sense that it's, I think, the last great movie he did that was truly a very sharp satire of the kind of stuff that you would see in a serious version of this film. Some great visual work too. Nods not only to Star Wars, but to other science fiction films like Planet of the Apes and a number of other things that we're all familiar with. Well, some of us are familiar with that. Now, this is a joke from Spaceballs itself. Yogurt at one point says that one day we'll be doing a sequel called Spaceballs 2, The Search for More Money which was also a joke based on the subtitle of a Star Trek film that was called The Search for Spock. Search for More Money is my attempt to try to sum things up a bit by saying he did do a number of other films after Spaceballs. This is actually a picture of him directing while in costume as a rich man down on his luck in a film called Life Stinks. He also did parodies of Robin Hood with a movie called Men in Tights. And the last movie he ever directed, he went back to horror with a movie called Dracula, Dead and Loving It. Now, the sad thing is, if you're a Mel Brooks fan, they're all worth taking a look at. But at this point in his career, as with many directors, you could argue, he reached a point where it was diminishing returns. History of the World Part One was one of the last truly great movies of his classic run to many, myself included. Spaceball showed the last great example of him really aiming himself in terms of parody at a topic and capturing it well. And in his last few films, he tried a few more things. Some people do like Robin Hood quite a bit, but it was toward the end of his filmmaking career. Fortunately, however, he had another option. And it was Anne Bancroft, I think, who actually suggested to him, why not take some of your original material from the past and put it on Broadway? The result initially was to take the producers and turn it into a Broadway production. And I'm sure many of you are familiar with the extraordinary success that that experienced. It led to another feature film where they took Nathan Lane and Matthew Broderick, who originated the roles on stage, and basically did another film version of the producers, sort of a remake of the original, uh, sort of filtered through the Broadway production. But it was an incredible production that led to many other uh, versions of it uh, all around, not just Broadway itself, huge success. And it also led to the production of a similar musical adaptation, A Young Frankenstein. He's also been threatening to do the same thing with Blazing Saddles. There's really no stopping this guy. He's in his 90s and he won't stop working. And of course, he's also been honored at this point to an extraordinary degree. He's received Kennedy Center honors. The picture you see here is from the AFI uh, Lifetime Achievement Award that he received a few years ago. He's been lauded by some of the many people that often used to criticize him for being crude and inappropriate in his comedy. Of course, that's what happens. You last long enough and you become a legend. And he's enjoying every minute of that. And I don't blame him. And as I said, I got to meet him once. It was an absolute joy for the couple minutes I had a chance to shake his hand and, and tell him how much he meant to me and his work. But I think for many of us, like I said at the beginning, that grow up at a particular time that are Jewish in America, that are looking for something that is identifiable and, and familiar. A man like Mel Brooks comes along and shows you that you're not alone, that your perspective on the world has merit, and that you can look at even the darkest and most horrific things and find laughter and humor in them and joy. And that's one of the things I hope we got to share tonight also. And I thank all of you for being here. That was fantastic, Arnold. Thank you so, so much. It's absolutely fascinating. Oh, you're very welcome. Um, so just a quick reminder to those of you who are in the audience with us this evening, those of you who are with us in Zoom, um, if you've got any questions for Dr. Bloomberg, please pop those into the Q&A. We'll try and get through as many of them as we possibly can. For those of you that are joining us uh, from Facebook this evening, if you can pop your questions uh, straight into the comment section um, and my colleagues going to make sure they make their way over to us as well. So um, we already have one question here for us. So OK, somebody has asked if you could talk about Mel's relationship with another of Sid Caesar's writers, someone by the name of Alan Stewart Konigsberg. OK, 
I did mention briefly as yes, Alan Stewart Konigsberg is Woody Allen. Um, Woody Allen worked in one of his earliest gigs uh, as one of the writers on the show, uh, along with a number of other people that went on to huge careers of their own. That was quite a, a crucible of comedy there, your show shows. Um, I haven't come across a lot then, and maybe you have more than I have. So it's just personally, I haven't come across a lot uh, that actually shows a lot of interaction between the two of them specifically, like what they thought. I know that Woody Allen had a lot of regard for and talked about Mel Brooks's uh, humor. Um, but I also know that many people that work with Mel Brooks intimately, even people that were close with him, would also find that he could be difficult to deal with because he could be very domineering. And so it's considering Woody Allen's uh, persona, I wonder how much they had any clashing or, or worked well together, but I'm not 100% sure. But uh, that's about as much as I know about that. Yeah, that's an interesting angle to think about on that one, isn't it? Um, okay, okay. So somebody's asked you, uh, touching upon where you wrapped up, do you think Blazing Saddles will ever make it to Broadway? <laughs> I'm not sure. Like I was saying, I mean, that's the thing. Blazing Saddles, if you grew up with it and we all saw it back then, fine. You try to show that to somebody now, there's stuff in there that frankly, and, and I'm not saying I disagree, there's stuff that just doesn't translate anymore. We have a different level of sensibility about what's right and wrong, even when trying to make valid points about racism, it's, it's the way you do it. And the way he did it fit in 74, maybe even the 80s, but it doesn't fit now. I do know, however, I'd have to look it up and I don't have the opportunity to do that this minute. I can tell you one thing about it. They're doing an animated um, adaptation of Blazing Saddles where they're doing it with animals and they're translating it from a Western to, I forget if it's a samurai. I think I might be wrong. I, I think it's Blazing Samurai. They're doing a crazy uh, kids movie. And if, if all things that I could think of, I would never have told you Blazing Saddles will live again as a children's animated film, but that's apparently what's happening right now. So I think it's Blazing Samurai. I'll try to look while we're answering some other things. That's kind of mad. Um, it's, it's insane. Yeah. <laughs> Hold on, I'll tell you what, let's see if Laura, who's our tech, ter tech person in the background, Laura, can you do a quick Google for us and see if you can work out whether it is indeed Blazing Samurai. Oh, I already found it. You found it? Amazing. <laughs> Blazing Samurai. Sam Jackson, George Takei, Ricky Gervais. Um, here, you know what? A, like, like, it's really big then. Like, that's not some, like... Yeah. The, the, the poster cat. has a really big cat who is the samurai, I guess. So there you go. Okay. Well, something for everyone to look for. Or to when we can get back into movie theaters then. So. maybe um okay really quick question here um somebody's asked if you could let us know where it is that you teach please right now i'm teaching primarily at umbc teaching entirely online i do first year composition and writing courses and i i do them with a particular bent like if i'm teaching courses that other instructors would also teach my sections always have a pop culture kind of theme so i give kids television movies, things from pop culture to use as their inspiration for writing what they write. So right now I'm doing that at UMBC. We're entirely on right, online right now and probably will be at least through the spring. So that's where I'm continuing to teach. Sounds like a really fun class to take. Um, okay, next question that we've got here. Did Mel Brooks have a true interest in space? I think you could certainly say so in as much as like anyone else, particularly when he was working on Spaceballs, uh, he talked about, you know, you grow up a kid at a certain time, you're all wrapped up in a lot of the same things. The, the, the look ahead to what our country can achieve, the, the inspiration of the kind of people that try to, you know, reach beyond to a new frontier. And I don't know the degree to which it was perhaps uh, a huge influence on him in his life beyond the general interest that a lot of us have had in it. He certainly was a fan of pop culture and certainly loved all the same things. And that's why his work encompasses so much of that. So it's not surprising that something like Spaceballs or Jews in Space are, are so, uh, so well regarded. Right, that makes sense. Um, okay, I'm gonna come oh hold on first of all i just want to let everyone know if you are interested in learning more about 
blazing samurais. Um, there is a link to the IMDb page in the chat for you right now. Um, so next up, I'm going to combine a couple of questions that we've got that really are about how you, th you think, or, or maybe Mel Brooks talks about it, how his Jewish heritage informed his comedy, um, which you sort of touched upon, but maybe if you can build upon that a little bit for us. Well, yeah, I mean, a lot of what I said about it is only because I spent my entire life reading every interview he ever, I mean, I arguably, I could say this was one of the presentations I felt the most prepared for before I ever did anything for it. Cause I've just, I've lived my whole life watching Mel Brooks. I love him and I've read everything and there've been a million documentaries. And, and like I said, at the beginning, you also have to take everything he says with a grain of salt, but there's stuff that comes through. One of the things that is true, however, and I actually have something I can refer to specifically for you is his relationship to his Jewish heritage. And like many people, myself included, uh, he didn't see himself as Jewish in terms of an observant or a religious sense, but in terms of a cultural sense. And in fact, there's one quote here where he talks about, uh, he says, I'm rather secular. I'm basically Jewish, but I'm Jewish not because of the religion. It's the relationship with the people and the pride I have. The tribe surviving so many misfortunes and being so brave and contributing so much knowledge to the world and showing courage. And he often mentioned too that he would see certain movies as Jewish movies, even if they weren't necessarily that, because his point is the themes, the, the ideas behind it were about people persevering over incredible strife or running from oppressors and finding new life in a new place. He saw that as uniquely Jewish. So it was a huge influence on everything he did, but not in a religious or spiritual sense so much as uh, a cultural one, a sense of shared heritage. So I think you kind of very much sort of almost answered it, but the, the question that someone's already, that has put in, I want to sort of get at that right now. Yeah. Um, so I think it just sort of finishes out that thought. So someone's asked, do you think that he made his movies and comedy specifically for fellow Jews? And then everyone else, if they got something from it, that's lovely, but hmm. really he's making it for a Jewish audience at its core. That's a really interesting question. I don't know, I can't recall that he ever said anything that specifically addresses that? Um, I mean, in a sense, you can argue there is an easy answer because in a sense, you could say as a filmmaker, as a director, as someone who became one of the most successful filmmakers in the 1970s in particular, you can't be that successful if you're just trying to make movies for one segment of an audience, you're trying to aim for everybody. But it's also true to say that the kind of stuff he did even then was something that was not to everybody's taste. And I would argue if you were Jewish at a particular time, you could look at it and get a sense of it more than someone who was not particularly. But so I guess if I had to say, I would think he probably wouldn't consciously have done that. But I think the argument also often is make what makes you happy. And for him, he made the things that made him happy, made him laugh. And then the goal is to the rest of us laugh. And he certainly achieved that part. Um, okay, we've got another question again relating to his Jewish identity, which again, I think you sort of started touching on. Um, mm -hmm. So there's a question about how much did his Jewish heritage play in his life? Um, specifically asking, did he raise his children Jewish? Uh, that sort of side of things. I, I, I have to uh, plead a bit of ignorance on this and that I don't know 100% how much of that actually factored in to say Max's childhood. He's, he's a, and I'd say Max because actually Mel Brooks and Anne Bancroft were both married once before, very short marriages. And Brooks actually had three children with his first wife, children you never really hear much about. And most of them, I, the, the three of them have kind of, they've worked a little bit in Hollywood, a couple of, one of them is a painter but they kind of shied away from the spotlight. I'm not sure how much of that was deliberate or was their relationship. And I guess that happens sometimes in life. You have children with a, a second wife and Max seems to be everywhere all the time. Uh, but as far as them having a Jewish upbringing, I would assume in lack of any other information that it's similar to what he himself has talked about, a pride and a sense of who you are as being an essential part of your heritage 
than necessarily going to show or, or you know, observing anything. And I, that's probably what it was. Anne Bancroft was Catholic, but she wasn't observant either. Uh, she talked about how when she met him and they got married, her mother was just happy it was a man, so she didn't care, Jewish, whatever. Uh, so I don't think religion played a huge role for both of them. Um, okay, next up, Ira, I apologize. I skipped over your question. I did not mean to. So next question for you. Uh, did, did Frank Langella, who starred in The Twelve Chairs, ever speak to regretting his role in that movie? Oh, I, that, I don't know. I honestly don't know that one. I don't remember ever reading anything like that. Um, and by the way, it's a, Frank Langella is an incredible actor. He's uh, many, I don't know how many of you remember, he played Dracula once himself. He was Dracula in the 1970s film adaptation of Dracula. He was quite the lady killer looking, very suave, romantic Dracula figure. Uh, and he's aged well into doing a lot of very sinister character roles and things, but he was one of the stars of the 12 chairs. I don't know, I, I, I'm not sure about that one. I, I don't know, I'd, I'd, I'd hope not because a lot of people do have a good opinion of 12 chairs now. And, uh, and frankly, you know, you're an actor, you get gigs and you know, if you're still talking about you all these years later, what's to regret? So hopefully he doesn't think so. Um, okay, up next, we have got a question about, um, uh, do you think that the Inquisition musical number from History of the World is as memorable as Springtime for Hitler? That was a very good question. Um, I like questions that are just opinion questions because then I don't necessarily have to be right. I can just say. Um, <laughs> Fantastic. I would say no. Um, I mean, I, I think that sequence is amazing. Um, but no, I, I think... I think it kind of is pretty demonstrably no in the sense that springtime for Hitler is just such instant recognition in terms of the title alone. And even somebody that doesn't know it is going to get this weird sense of what could possibly be something called springtime for Hitler. It already sounds ridiculous. Mm -hmm. And the Inquisition yeah. number, I don't think in context in the movie with everything else happening, you go, oh my God, I can't believe he's doing this stuff. But Springtime for Hitler kind of stands alone as just this extraordinary idea in and of itself. So I'd say no, but I mean, not to belittle, I think everything in history of the world is awesome. So, uh, but yeah, I think I think Springtime for Hitler wins there. Now, now I'm on record saying that. Yeah, right. We're recording tonight, there's no going I know, back. I know. <laughs> um, okay, I think maybe let's try and do one last question. And I think, okay. um, I think I'm, I'm really, intrigued by this question and I'm sorry I didn't see it before. Um, so Elspeth asks, how did he manage to be Jewish and really putting that Jewishness out there whilst also facing anti-Semitism, um, you know, in a time when anti-Semitism yeah. was very much something that was out there in the world. How, how did yeah. those parts work? Not, not, that, not that it isn't out there right now too. Well, this is, a, yeah. Yes. I mean, the more things change, the more they stay the same, right? Um, so that's also a good question. And again, it's me theorizing more than anything else. It's, it's arguably part of his extraordinary achievement is his ability to be so beloved and work with so many people and be so entertaining and funny. And frankly, there's another thing. It's not just distinctly Jewish, but also distinctly for anyone who feels like the underdog in a situation, whether that's in school or as a kid, comedy is often an incredible defense mechanism for enabling you to get past things. There's a bully, how much easier is it maybe to make that person laugh than to try to fight? And I think that's distinctly an element of it too. And like I said, he's a sickly child. He, he had to find a way to connect with people that wasn't necessarily being a dominant physical presence. I think, Ultimately, a lot of his success comes down to his personality and the fact that he was able to make people laugh and then able to endear himself to people. Now, like I said earlier, there are people that worked with him that found that sometimes it could be difficult. I think that's more a case of when you have someone who has a singular vision as a director, particularly, you might clash when you're trying to do something on film. But if he was in a social situation with people, 
it goes back to the whole Tumblr thing too, I think. This was somebody who was keyed into the idea of this is how you entertain, this is how you make people happy. And maybe that's a key to the whole thing. It, it's true that some of those movies, I grew up thinking, I can't imagine how anybody isn't watching this thing and thinking this just sounds so Jewish. And yet people of all kinds loved it. There's, there's even the joke and when Carvey Corman has the joke at one point where he says, too Jewish. And it's, he was aware of it even while he was doing it in these films. So, so maybe that's a part of it. Okay, well, I think that feels like a great point at which to wrap us up this evening. Um, so Arnold, I just want to say thank you so much. It's always such a pleasure when you're able to present with us. And as Marvin said, it's a shame we're not all in the building, but- um, I, I still enjoy doing it. It's a pleasure every time. And I'm always here. If you want me to talk about somebody else I love, I'll be right back again doing it. But no, I, it's, it's a joy. I hope everybody else had a great time too. I'm sorry I can't see you all. It looks like you're getting much appreciation in the chat right now. Oh, so that's wonderful. I think it went down very well. Um, just a couple extra notes for those of you that are able to join us uh, this evening. As you leave the program tonight, you'll be directed to a survey. If you can take a couple of seconds to complete that survey for us, it's really helpful um, as we plan our programming, especially as we are continuing to adapt to this uh, virtual world. Um, I also just wanted to mention, uh, especially for those of you thinking about Hanukkah shopping, um, we have a, a Jews in Space section in our online Esther's, uh, Esther's Place Museum store. We're gonna drop a link for that into the chat now. A uh, great place to have a little look and see if there's anything uh, that you can check off of that shopping list. So anyway, with that, I'd just like to say thank you everyone for joining us. Um, again, thank you so much, always such a pleasure. Um, and I am sure we will be emailing you again very, very soon. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you. Good evening.